morning. Welcome to First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in St. Albans, Vermont. We are a welcoming and warm group of people here in St. Albans. We are a community of spiritual seekers, believers, and even doubters. And no matter where you are on your journey through this life, please know that you are welcome to journey with us here. As a reminder, we have suspended in-person worship for the time being. You are joining us either on channel 1079 or through YouTube or Facebook. If you are interested in learning more about the Bible, you are invited to join us for our online Bible series. We meet Wednesdays at 7 p.m. If you would like more information, please contact the office. Please join me for this morning's morning prayer in unison. As in days of old, Creator God, we come to look for your signs of covenant promises. Like the rainbow days of Noah, we see and know your signs and hear your voice again, directing us to places of preparation and transformation in our lives and in our world. Thank you, Thank you God, God, for your covenant signs in this season of Lent. Lent. Amen. Our opening hymn, O oh God, our help in ages past, verses 1, 3, and 6. It's part of your insert. Thank you. 
thinking about Noah's Ark a lot this week. And it makes me wonder if you know what a myth is. There's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to what a myth is. For many of us nowadays, it's something that isn't a fact. It's a lie, and we call it a myth. But in fact, a myth is a special kind of story, and it tells us something very special about us as human beings. So though it may not be a fact, it may not have happened, it contains a very deep truth about human beings and our relationship with the world and our relationship with God. So when we hear these special stories, and there are a lot of them in the Bible, Noah's Ark is one of them, please listen for what that story is telling you about your relationship with God. Let us have a prayer. Holy Creator, thank you for all the ways we have to investigate learn about our relationship with you, be it through myth or song or other stories. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Someday I'll get fast at that transition. This morning's scripture reading from the Hebrew scripture is from Genesis, chapter 9, 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all the flesh of the earth. Our gospel reading this morning is from Mark chapter 1 verses 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending upon him as a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited upon him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. So ends this morning's reading. May God add a blessing of understanding to these words. The Hebrew Scriptures 
reading is a little repetitive at times. And it's all about a rainbow. The glimmer of hope sandwiched between two rather disturbing scenes. The hope that comes with God's eternal covenant for every living creature. God will never again destroy life on earth. And God has made a sign of his promise in the form of a rainbow. When God sees the rainbow, God will be reminded of the promise. And when we see the rainbow, we too will be reminded and reassured of God's promise. Regardless of the trial, or the storm, or the tempest, it will all pass. God's presence and hope will guide us into a new tomorrow. How can you not love that? And it, it's so tempting to grasp onto the story of the rainbow and God's promise and ignore the stories that come right before the rainbow and right after the rainbow. The story before the rainbow, we all know it. People are sinning. God gets angry. God decides to send a flood to destroy all life on earth. But first, God finds one righteous man, Noah. And God tells Noah to build an ark and to save all the animals on earth. Well, two of each kind of animal, male and female, and to put them into the ark along with Noah's family. Noah does this. They're in the ark, and God sends rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And eventually, the rain stops. And finally, the wind blows, and the waters begin to recede. Noah sends out a dove to investigate, to see what's happening. The first time he sends out the dove, the dove comes back many hours later, exhausted, for he hadn't, she hadn't been able to find anywhere to rest. Noah waits seven days. He sends the dove out again. This time, she returns with an olive branch in her beak. Noah takes her back into the ark and sends her out again seven days later. But this time, the dove has, doesn't return. The dove has found somewhere to live. Dry land is, is at hand. We all love the story of Noah's ark. I remember as a teenager babysitting and in the baby's room, the parents had put up decals of Noah's Ark, the two-by-two two animals going up the ramp into the ark, the rainbow, the dove, the olive branch, pastel colors and soft, rounded bodies of the animals. It was, to my 15 or 16-year-old mind, the perfect nursery. Much later, when I was leading a Sunday school, Noah's Ark was really the perennial favorite. We had stuffed animals, uh, models of arcs, posters, coloring pages, games, you name it. But we didn't really learn much or think much about the poor creatures or humans that were left out of the Ark and out of God's covenant. I grew up in a heavily Irish area, and I remember as a child going to a local Irish band to hear them play. And all the children, we all gathered together and wait so anxiously for the unicorn song. It's so happy and quirky and funny. It's a song about Noah's Ark. God asks Noah to build the ark and collect the animals. And God has a special request. Don't forget the lovely unicorn. Well, Noah was able to collect the green alligators, the long-necked geese, some humpy-back camels and some chimpanzees, some rats and cats and elephants, and as sure as you're born, Noah couldn't find the unicorn. You see, the unicorns were playing and splashing in the water. And ultimately, they missed the boat. And that's why we don't have any unicorns today. I remember not really getting that as a child. I remember thinking, where are the unicorns? Are they on an island somewhere? Where did they go? I didn't 
get the implication that they had drowned. Poor things. It's kind of brutal. We typically don't think about the flood and destruction itself in this story. We don't think about the mass destruction of life. We're pretty glib, and we don't see its potential to inure us to the concept or the fact of genocide. I end up wondering if hope, the hope of the rainbow, came a little too late. On the other side of the rainbow story is the curse of Canaan. This also comes from chapter 9 in Genesis, and directly after this morning's reading. It has to do with Noah and his three sons, Ham, Shen, and Japheth. Noah, after the ark, has planted a vineyard, and he becomes drunk and he falls asleep naked. Ham, his son, comes upon Noah, and he sees Noah naked, drunk, and asleep. Ham tells his brothers what he's seen, and Noah later also finds out He's very upset that Ham has seen him drunk, asleep, and naked. Now Ham is the father of Canaan, and Noah, upset at Ham, curses Canaan. He says, Cursed be Canaan, lowest of the slaves shall be his brothers. Blessed by my Lord, my God is Shem, and Canaan shall be his slave. May God make space for Japheth, and let him live in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. That's harsh. But the real darkness of this story is how the passage has been used to justify oppression and slavery. See, for many years, the word ham was misinterpreted to mean dark or black. And according to Hebrew scriptures professor Justin Michael Reed, the curse of Canaan has been used as a theological backbone of Christian oppression, the persecution of Jews, Muslims enslaving non-Muslims, Christians enslaving people of African heritage, even the Hutu massacring the Tutsi. In a 2003 article in the New York Times, Felicia R. Lee writes, by the 19th century, many historians agree, the belief that African Americans were descendants of Ham was a primary justification for slavery among Southern Christians. I'm gonna read that again. By the 19th century, many historians agree, the belief that African Americans were descendants of Ham was a primary justification for slavery among Southern Christians. That's not all that long ago. And it's more than unpleasant history. It's dangerous stuff. Oh, the unholy things we can find justification for in the Bible, if we look. Even slavery and war. I get a bit discouraged when I read some of these texts, and I think about how we've used them. And part of me wants to gloss over the difficult bits, but it's part of our history. And we need to be aware of the pitfalls and aware of how history tends to repeat itself. Discouraging. Mass destruction of life, not just humans, on the one side of the rainbow, slavery and oppression on the other, and we all just want to focus on the rainbow. It's so odd. At our Bible study on Wednesday, my husband Stephen mentioned the specific language used by God in our reading. God said, Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. That's very specific, he was thinking. Patty caught his drift and said, well, maybe not a flood, but what about COVID? True enough. There's always some existential threat. We find ourselves in the middle of all sorts of things, from a prolonged pandemic to the environmental disaster of the climate-driven, climate change-driven storms in Texas, wreaking havoc on people and indeed all living creatures. 
freezing temperatures, loss of power, water shortages. We see the sinfulness of a system that put profit over people and has abandoned them in their hour of need. We all participate in oppression, perhaps unwittingly. From the privilege we enjoy, you know, we maybe we buy an, an iPhone that's been manufactured by children born into poverty. Maybe we reap the benefit from a skewed and racist system. And yet we focus on the rainbow of God's hope, that promise. And it occurs to me that maybe our minds just can't dwell anymore on the hardship. Maybe we're already so very aware of the death and destruction. Maybe the death and destruction has become a given. Maybe it's become the premise upon which we live our lives. Maybe this has become so much so that we don't really need to pay it that much mind in these stories. Maybe we can look to the hope. Maybe that's where we should be focused because that's the unusual thing about these stories. The unusual thing is the hope. So we keep looking for hope. And usually, we find it. Even during the difficulties of COVID, we see neighbors helping neighbors. These are bright lights, small rainbows in our world. In Texas, we see hope. We see even a version of Noah's Ark where rescuers and community members are saving thousands of sea turtles, bringing them inside these cold, stunned sea turtles. So perhaps I was getting too cynical. Perhaps those elephants and tigers and armadillos on the nursery wall tell a story that doesn't have to point to destruction. It doesn't necessarily inure us to genocide. Perhaps the message is this. Little one, welcome to the world. You will surely know sorrow and loss. You will be buffeted by storms and tempests. You will witness the foibles and horrors of humankind. But little one, know this. Don't be disheartened. Look at this rainbow, at this dove, at this olive branch. Little one, you're not traveling alone. In the midst of all of this, you are loved, and a new tomorrow awaits you. Isn't that what we all crave to hear? This too will pass. You are loved. A new tomorrow awaits. Amen. Our second hymn this morning, Hymn of Promise, Verses 1 and 3 in your insert. Thank you. 
Noah's Ark was a favorite with my Sunday school kids, and that hymn was also a big hit with my kids. As a reminder, if you have a joy or concern you would like us to pray about, please let me know by Thursday. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Holy One, creator of all, lover of all creation, today we gather in a new kind of worship, physically separated from each other, distant. May your spirit help keep us connected to one another. May we be reminded that you are always near, O oh God of peace. Amen. Mm -hmm. 